So, Vessel, a powerful introduction there for those people who don't know you. I don't know you. We just met a few minutes ago. Subten mentions you're 35 years old. You're CEO of a company. You're working hard. What happens? Well, um, at the peak of our success, my brother who's here, Faris, and I um, were operating in uh, five countries in Eastern Europe together with my cousin and seven countries in war-torn Africa, running a business in the hundreds of millions, obviously thinking I was invincible and in U.S. terms we say thinking my shit didn't stink, and um, went from that position to being told that I wasn't going to make it. Um, when that happened, obviously, you... You know, the first question you ask is why, and then you start to truly understand, you know, what's going on. So, fortunately for me, I had the four elements we look at first is access to the best medical care, affordability for the medical care, family support. In my case, it was my parents, my wife at the time, my brother who dropped everything and was there as truly a tree, and thank you and my cousin, Mahmoud. So after enduring 20 rounds of chemo, now most people have one chemo every three weeks. When I was told the probability of survival, I asked for the maximum because I said to the doctor that I want to be able to look my children in their eyes and say Baba did his best, but the big man decided otherwise. And so instead of having one round every three weeks, they decided to give me five days of chemo in a row. Now I'm going to share some details so that we start to appreciate the basic things like water that he just served. So I would come in on a Monday and I would have five days of chemo, three hours and then 45 minutes of, of prep. And in that five days, I would lose five kilos. And there were days where I would be able to only have a cap full of water. So that water became a luxury. Food became a luxury. When I would get home, the first week, I couldn't taste food. So imagine having samosas, kebabs, and you taste nothing. So the first week, I would have to imagine the taste, eat anyway, in order to maintain my weight. And then the week after, I would be able to taste the food, so I would gain the five kilos so I could repeat the process. When I would come home on the Saturday, I would get on my knees, put my head on my wife's lap, and wail like a child, and I beg, to not take me back. But her having experienced her mother passing away at the age of 40 and her being 20, she knew that if she answered the question, it would be game over. But thankfully to my two kids who were one and three, I would spend the two weeks and have the courage to go back for the same exercise. So I did that. After 20 rounds, I was put in isolation. I had three surgeries. And after I did my first five rounds, I asked the doctor, I said, what happened? I said, we don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? There's no answer. I said, this is not possible, right? You're a hard-hitting CEO, type A personality, you need answers. So I started talking to integrative doctors, yoga master, et cetera. They started telling me about imbalance. And then I walked into my integrative medicine doctor and I said, she goes, so how are you doing? I said, I'm finished. She goes, how were you before? I said, I was going 100 miles an hour. And now? I said, zero. She goes, how do you feel physically? I said, I'm on my knees. She goes, perfect. Prostate and beg for your life. I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? Am I paying you for this? She goes, yes, prostate and beg for your life. She paused and then she said, you're an arrogant human being. You asked nothing from God. And I stepped back and I said, actually, you're right. I've got the most incredible wife. I've got two loving children. My parents are amazing beyond anything I could help for. My brother is a support system that I wish all of you have. I had intelligence. I cranked it by the age of 25, had a great lifestyle. I said, no, I don't. I don't actually ask. And I left the room, and you won't believe, I spent the next nine months at the end of every namaz begging to be alive for the next namaz. Because my energy was so low, I had to actually take a nap between each namaz. And I lived nine months, namaz to namaz. I actually got to learn what surrender means. And, and I'm sharing this story because I gave up what I didn't, I gave what I didn't have, right? And you are here today as CEOs of your various companies and philanthropists. And in both, you are giving, you're adding value to society, 
which is why you make profit. And therefore, you are giving to society by creating jobs and social responsibility, etc. At the same time, you're now taking this onus of, of philanthropy. Now, how is that going to be sustainable unless you begin with yourself? So I was talking to Dr. D not long after, and he said, you're a selfish human being. And this is after eight years of serving family, unprivileged, and everybody, you know, hospital access, medical access, I mean, you name it. And I said, what? And he goes, yes. I said, how does it, he goes, how does it feel when you give? I said, it feels incredible. And he goes, you know what? By not receiving, you're depriving others of that fulfilling. So the mothers in this room who I do a lot of talks with, right? And I talk about self-care and self-love. I talk about them being the center of the care universe. But you can't give what you don't have, like Mahmoud mentioned. You, it all begins with ourselves. So how are we, in order to sustain the longevity, not only of the businesses we run, but also of the philanthropy you are doing, and have generational continuity, what is the system and structure you're going to be putting in place to answer, how do I eat? How do I move? How do I sleep? How do I think? And how do I feel? I recently did a DNA test for cancer to understand whether I have any gen genetic predisposition to disease. And guess what? Zero. Zero. 50% is nature, 50% is nurture. So I'm one creative dude, right? 10 tumors, Rubik's cube in my chest, tennis ball in my neck, and eight in my lungs. Hard-hitting CEO, hard-hitting creative cancer dude, right? So how are we, I mean, in this room, I'm sorry to say, the genetic predisposition to cholesterol, diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, I mean, we have been handed a raw hand. So just to be clear for the audience's purposes, what do you do now since you recovered? Well, in terms of my lifestyle or in terms of... Both. In terms of well, career? In terms of, well, I, we, we ended up exiting most of the countries. So we exited all the countries in Africa except for Angola. Um, we eventually an, exited Eastern Europe in 2011 after a 20-year run. And then, lucky for me, when I came back from remission, I was helping family members who were getting sick. And over the seven years, I created an informal structure of a family health office, without labeling it that, where I was the go-to guy for anything that happened, reactive as well as proactive. And today, four and a half years ago, we set up the world's first family health, health office, which is the same thing. A family office manage wealth, we manage health and well-being. How do you manage wealth? How do you manage health? Well, we first have, we have three pillars. So the first pillar is medical. So like I said, we understand what is your medical predisposition to disease? How how did you get here? So your whole medical history from birth until now. Then you're looking at, what is my lifestyle today? So I understand, where did I come from? How did I get here? Where do I stand today? Then we curate all the medical records so that they're accessible on your phone, just like anything else you have. Then we build a medical team for you. Just like you have RMs, we have nurses and health coordinators that will manage your, your family in terms of handling the appointments and if something happened. The second pillar is what I mentioned earlier is, how I think, how I feel, how I sleep, how I move, and how I eat. Now the eat and move has been done, because I was this size, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't, I don't even drink coffee, tea, nothing. I ate home food, and I still got crushed, right? So when Mahmoud mentioned it's very lonely at the top, that's one of the things to reflect on. I had nobody to truly talk to. So I was with some people, and I ask CEOs all the time, I say, how many people do you have in your life that can, you can be truly naked with, and I don't mean physically, that you can talk about everything, your financial, your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings, your business, everything, what you're feeling, what you're thinking. And sad to say, we come alone, we go alone. And I'm sorry to say, but 90% plus, and I'm being polite, tell me that they have nobody. So we're actually living alone. Now, how sad is that? What is the... If you're going to boil it down, a lot of people are going to hear what you're saying and say, okay, what you're saying sounds reasonable, it makes sense. It's, you know, what practical advice, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, would you give based off your experiences and the reading you've done? I mean, someone like, I used to work for Ariana Huffington, okay. who's big into changing yeah. lifestyles yeah. now. She wrote a book called Thrive. Yeah. Her big thing is sleep. Yes. That people in the sleep corporate world yeah. do not sleep enough, do exactly. not get enough sleep. We focus too much on our work. What's your particular angle? Do you have one? 
Well, I mean, it's, it's again, it's the five pillars where first when you're eating, of course, I also enjoy samosas and kebabs and pakoras and the rest of it, right? But let's look at eating like you do your investments. Return on ingestion. Let's eat with the end in mind, not with just what is giving me satisfaction now. Imagine if you ran your business like that, right? So the question to CEO is, do you have the same level of energy throughout the day? Because if you don't, there's something that's not working in terms of your consumption. When it comes to moving, yes, it's able to remove the toxicity in your body, right? But the question becomes, how do I avoid that toxicity? And we work with mind trainers, which are meditation specialists, to help you tap into your subconscious. Because remember, 3 to 5% of what you do is conscious. 95 to 97 is subconscious. So who would you rather tap into, your conscious or your subconscious? Then sleep, right? The mo most of the people who deal with sleep issues are those who have sleep apnea. But what about those who don't and have something in the middle? So when I talk to a lot of men, I say, so do you sleep through the night? Oh, yeah, of course. And I ask, oh, so do you wake up between 3.30 and 4 to go to the bathroom? Oh, yeah, of course. Right? Because when they're going into deep REM sleep, they're bouncing right back up. So pre-cancer, when I went to bed, if Uzma turned in bed, I would know. That means my car was in first gear 24-7. Right? When it comes to thinking, I'd be at dinner, and she'd ask me a question, and I'd be like, huh? And she'd ask me again. And there's two of us in a, on a table. It's not like there's 15 people. And I'd do the same thing. So are we truly present? with our loved ones. Right now, each one of you probably has thoughts coming in out of your head, right? And, and how do you settle that? So it's through the training. Interesting. And what about when people say to you, well, you talk about health management and health, uh, family health clinic and having nurses, but you're not a medical practitioner yourself. No, I'm not. So how does that fit in with your business? No, so basically we have, I mean, what, what is the business model or? In terms of how you, because I'm just trying to get a sense of how you do it, because it's something I've never heard of before. So yeah, so, how does it work? Yeah, so I mean, I, I explained the first part. That's actually what's called the onboarding process to, to really understand. So the first process is to get to know yourself, really get to know yourself, and then build a team that truly knows you, right? And we run businesses, a lot of people in, 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 in very challenging countries, we do crisis preparation. So that there's no crisis management, it's a response, not a reaction. Are we prepared for the inevitable? Right? The inevitable is change and curveballs. Right? So are we ready for that? Because it's, it's going to happen. And what would you say? A lot of people in this room, obviously, what you're saying to them, they've probably thought about maybe on their own at some stage, uh, being told by yeah. people outside, you know, being present. I have that issue all the time. My wife, one of my wife's biggest complaints is I'm always thinking about what's my next task, my next article, my next interview, what do I need to read, what's happening in the news, distracted, perpetually distracted yeah. from children. It's, so it's all very well analyzing that. We all get the analysis, yeah. but it's not easy to change that. And I'm listening to you now. Am I going to behave any differently tomorrow night when I'm at dinner? Well, probably not. No, if you don't how do, you, training, how, do you, how do you make the change? So the training is through, like I said, mind training, which is meditation. I went on a six-day, seven-day silent retreat. So no phones? No phones, oh no emails, God. no computers. Even the book I read was approved by the person who was running the retreat. I don't okay. think I've ever been six days without email in the last decade. Okay, so let me tell you what happened, right? So the first day you go in, you're meditating seven, eight hours a day. So this is not like, and you're working out twice, okay? So the first day you go in and you're like, oh, I've got a lot of thought. The next day you realize, you're like, wow, I got a lot of repetitive thought. The third day, you're like, wow, I got a lot of repetitive, absolutely useless, mundane nonsense. And then it's the breakthrough. And that's when the waterfall breaks and everything starts to calm down because you've walked in with inertia, a lot of inertia, right? And, and that breaks it down. And then eventually, over day four, day five, I mean, the minimum retreats we do is four days, right? So, you now, so you, you now carry out these Oh, retreats. yeah, we carry out the retreats with CEOs because... This is the only way to change your, for example, like I said, when it comes to, let's say I say something to, to a boss and he reacts. He can go to the gym and let it out. He can journal and let it out. But how is he going to change the response the next time me or somebody else says something similar? He can't do it consciously. So the only way he can tap in to rewire wire that response is through meditation. And so that's the technique where, and it's not like you have to have a clear indication that, oh, I want to work on what Faisal said. No. The beauty of meditation is it just cleans itself. 
So here's that a, is the... Here's a question for you. The last panel we were talking to a lot of successful rich people, a lot of <laughs> successful rich people in this room. If there's a choice to be made between, you know what, slowing down, meditating a bit more, focusing more on the health stuff, but you know what, I might not make as much money. That's uh, a real that's, dilemma. That's actually nonsense because the meditation and the training I'm talking to you about is going to have you be much more centered. That means you're able to step out of the situation, be more objective, not be reactive, not react, but respond, not bring your emotions into the system, be truly present, to, put, to be truly focused, and it will take your game to another level. Because the programs we run for CEOs, it's all about high performance, because they don't want to hear anything else. So you're not, they trying, to crank get, you're not trying to get people to do less? Or make no, no, no. We're trying to have them do less and have much more output. Just like Mama David just said, right? I want to invest a dollar, and I want the maximum on the other end. So it's how do I, I always tell people, I'm the specialist in becoming the laziest guy on earth, because I want to be able to do less and get more done. Right? Why not? Delegate everything Interesting. that you don't need to do. We have to wrap up. I'm just going to ask very quickly. Anyone got a question that they want to ask? Anything they want to get detail? Samir. Okay, what you talk about? Are there any role models? There's a microphone right there. You know, for, for everything, role models are great yeah. uh, centers you can focus on and look at. I mean, this new kind of living where you're balancing yes. things. Any role models you can put forward to us we can look at? I mean, of course, you've got area, Huff area, you know, Arianne Huffington that talks about sleep your way to the top, right? You look at Ray Dalio, right? The number one hedge fund performer in the world. What does he tell you is a secret sauce? Meditation. He's been trained by Tony Robbins for the last over two decades, right? And he's the number one performer, right? So if you go in, you, 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 if you went and, and you went to India and you asked the top CEOs, what's your magic sauce? You asked the top Chinese big boys, family guys. You know what they do? They spend one hour every day, they ask a question, and they meditate. And the answer comes. Like, I'll tell you the difference, right? Something happens and you need to answer a question. What do you do? You take a piece of paper, or you take a computer, and you start sorting it out, right? What do us lazy people do? We ask the question, and we go to bed. And next morning, we have the answer. So I don't know. If you want to break your whatever, go ahead. But I'd rather ask the question, go to bed, and have the answer when I'm meditating or taking a shower. I don't know. I get, all, I get all my article ideas in the shower, and then I forget them by the time I'm out. Okay. <laughs> I would have so many good pieces if I could remember what I thought about in the shower. <laughs> Should we take one more question, then we've got to wrap it up? Yes, Dr. Moon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Nizar Merali. I'm a general practitioner, medical oh, practitioner okay. in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I met your mom and dad, remarkable people. They've been to London recently. You know, it fascinates me what you just said. Um, so for 40 years I've been in practice, and today I can think of at least 10 people in our community suffering with similar conditions to what you did. And obviously what you just told me goes beyond my medical science knowledge. So I would love to spend time, even if you allowed me at 1 a.m. tonight, I want to spend one hour with you. Well, he's going to be that's sleeping. That's four hours. hours. Yeah, that's four hours. He can't give you one a.m. He's sleeping and resting. <laughs> uh, I, I, exactly. I, I, I must spend some time with you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, in the next 24 hours. Um, okay. But, but I salute you. Thank you. Very briefly, very briefly, if you've got a point. Because we're out of time. Um, Faisal, thanks so much for that. Just two points I, I want to bring up. Um, exactly from what you've said, I've spoken to so many people this weekend, and one question I ask everyone is, uh, what percentage do you feel you're playing life on? And most people in this room have said between kind of 30 and 50%. My point is that this, this is about giving, right? And if the amount of success we've got in this room is playing at between 30 and 50%, imagine what we could achieve if we're playing at 80%, okay? And that's about unlocking our energy. Okay, number one. Second thing is, you know, why is it that we all have to wait for a calamity to happen before we take action? We've got, you know, we can learn from each other. We don't have to wait to have a heart attack or to have cancer before we start taking action, but most people only react. But that's and why I'm telling the story, right? I want you to learn from idiots like me. I'm not here up here to, to do anything else. I want you to make better choices based on my life lesson and not have to pay the school fees. That's why we're here today, right? We're here to leverage each other's strengths, whether it's running businesses or philanthropy, so that each one of us doesn't pay the school fees and waste resources, but we can learn from each other. So today, it's really, how can we all, well, like I said, go ahead. I'm gonna say, we're out of time, but Fessel's here. If you wanna to talk to him, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you afterwards, give out advice to everyone, as long as it's, everyone gets their sleep and rest. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you.